Hi there, and welcome to a new episode of Literature Snacks. Again, this is a Christmas edition. So last year I analyzed A Christmas Carol from Charles Dickens. This year, for Christmas, I decided to bring to you the analysis of a real book for children. As we all know, the Dickens one isn't. I'm going to analyze The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia from C.S. Lewis. Are you ready? So, let's go. C.S. Lewis was born and raised in Ireland but educated in England where he attended the prestigious University of Oxford. He left university to fight in World War I, but after he was wounded in 1918, he went back to his studies. But as you can imagine, the horror that he witnessed in the war changed him forever. He thought he had lost his faith. And it was only thanks to the friendship that he built with J.R.R. Tolkien, the writer of The Lord of the Rings, that he was able to find his faith again. From then on, he went on writing fiction and non-fiction, exploring the depth of Christianity and celebrating it. The Chronicles of Narnia, his most famous work, is famous for merging biblical theme and fantastic theme altogether. Fun fact, the name Narnia was deliberately inspired to him by the Italian town of Narni, a small medieval village near Perugia famous for having a whole city underground discovered by a small group of volunteers who started digging in 1979 and they are still ongoing discovering more and more about the city underground. If you have never been there, consider visiting it. It was stirring enough to inspire C.S. Lewis and the town is truly magic. What about the plot of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe? The story starts in the middle of World War II with the harrowing land air raids. The four protagonists, Peter, Susan, Edmund and Lucy, are sent to the countryside in the care of a wealthy professor. Lewis was working in Oxford as a professor at the time of World War II and he himself sheltered three schoolgirls from the city. While the siblings are exploring the house, Lucy, the youngest, finds a big room with only a wardrobe inside. She climbs into the wardrobe, finding deeper than she expected. She continues walking until she finds herself walking on fresh snow. When she raises her eyes, she discovers herself in a snowy wood and in front of her there is an old lamppost. A few minutes later, a phone comes up, wearing a scarf and carrying packages. He is so struck by seeing Lucy that he drops everything and asks her if she is a daughter of Eve. That means if she is a human. The phone, whose name is Mr. Topnos, explains to Lucy that she is now in a world called Narnia, when humans are rarely seen there. Mr. Topnos invites Lucy over to his cave. He offers her a good dinner and tells a story about Narnia, but when Lucy tries to go home, he stops her. He then breaks into tears and confesses that he is at the service of the despotic White Witch who has declared herself a queen of Narnia and uses her power to make Narnia always winter and never Christmas. The White Witch has explicitly ordered to every inhabitant of Narnia to bring to her every human they would find. Tomnus is a good soul, he doesn't want to turn Lucy in, but he is afraid of what the White Witch would do to him should she ever discover his betrayal. Tomnus in the end resolves to let Lucy go. He brings her to the lamppost and Lucy finds her way back to the wardrobe. When Lucy comes back, she finds out that she'd been gone for just a few minutes. She tells her siblings what she has seen and exhorts her siblings to see with their eyes. But when they get to the wardrobe though, it's just an ordinary wardrobe and Lucy is teased by her siblings. On the next rainy afternoon, while the children are playing hide and seek, both Lucy and Edmund hide into the wardrobe and this time they both get into Narnia. Edmund is alone 
amazed and disoriented because Lucy had gone before him and she is nowhere to be seen. At this point, a large sleigh with an elegant woman with a crown arrives and presents herself as the Queen of Narnia. Once the witch understands that Edmund is a human, the queen offers him some Turkish delight and manages to gather information about himself, his siblings and the first visit of Lucy. She tells him to bring her siblings to her castle and she promises more sweets and also he promises that she will make him Prince of Narnia. The Queen leaves and Lucy arrives. She speaks her relief for the fact that Mr. Tumnus is okay and tells Edmund all about the White Witch. Edmund at this point realizes that he had just been speaking with her but remains silent. Once back into the real world, Edmund doesn't back up Lucy with the story and she gets so angry that Peter and Susan, the older siblings, decided to ask the professor for help. Unexpectedly, the professor encouraged them to believe Lucy that, by Susan and Peter's admission, has always spoken the truth rather than Edmund. A few days later, while the children are trying to hide themselves from the professor's housekeeper, they all hide into the wardrobe and all four end up into Narnia. Lucy brings the group to Mr. Tumnus' house, but they find a note on his door that he has been placed under arrest for high treason. Lucy states that she can't possibly lead her friend to his destiny and then spots a robin that is trying to lead them somewhere. While following it, they encounter a beaver who urges them to follow him. The beaver can speak and he tells them all about Hasland, that he is on the move and help is on the way. Mr. Beaver invites the children to his house where they discuss what can be done for Mr. Thomas and Mr. Beaver is convinced that it is better to wait for Hasland and promises to take them to him tomorrow. There is a prophecy in Narnia that states that four humans will end the reign of the White Witch. Only then the children notice that Edmund has gone. Mr. Beaver states that Edmund has been touched by the magic of the witch and that he has gone to her castle. Edmund has indeed gone to the witch's house that is full of stone animals because she turns traitor into stone. Edmund warns the witch about the coming of Aslan and she takes him to her sleigh in the place where Aslan is due to come. While they approach, they realize that the snow is melting and that is a sign of the white witch power fading due to Aslan's presence. They are forced to abandon the sleigh and continue on foot. In the meantime, the beavers, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, Peter, Susan and Lucy arrive at the stone table, where a battle camp has been set up. They encounter Father Christmas on the way and he has gift for them. The children meet now Aslan, a big speaking lion with a deep calming voice. Aslan enquires where Edmund is and the kids reply that he has turned into a traitor and but ask him if there is a way to save him. Aslan replies that saving Edmund might not be as easy as they may think. At this point a troop from the Queen's police attack the camp. Peter fights fearlessly and when the fight is over Aslan knights Peter for his bravery. A rescue party manages to rescue Edmund from the witch but the day after the witch comes into the battle camp demanding for Edmund's blood as according to the old laws of Narnia she is the executioner of the traitors. Aslan and the witch have a private conversation, at the end of which she renounces the claim over Edmund, but she has clearly made a deal with Aslan. That night, Susan and Lucy can't sleep and they decided to check on Aslan. They find him sneaking out of the camp and after following him for a while, Aslan allows the girls to accompany him with the promise that they will go back when he tells them to do so. The party approaches to the stone table, an ancient altar permeated with the ancient magic of Narnia. Aslan warns the girl to go back, but they hide in the woods and observe. Aslan walks toward the stone table where the witch and her minions are waiting for him. They beat him, shave his mane, tie him and ultimately the witch kills him on the altar. 
The girls wait for the witch and her followers to leave and go to the stone table to untie the corpse of Aslan, upon which they cry. When they are about to leave, they hear a giant crack. And when they turn back, they find that the table stone broken in two and Aslan is resurrected. The ancient laws of Narnia don't allow an innocent to be executed on the stone table. All together, Aslan, Lucy and Susan rush to the witch's castle and free all the animals she has turned into stone. Once gathered an army, Aslan leads the group back to the camp where the battle takes place and the witch with her army is finally defeated. Aslan crowns the four sibling kings and queens of Narnia and they govern Narnia for many years, forgetting their previous life in the real world. Until one day, the four arrive at the lamppost that looks familiar, but they can't really understand why. They explore the area around the lamppost until they stumble out of the wardrobe. They are children again, and not a minute has passed since they have left. They go to the professor to tell him everything, and to their surprise, he believes them and reminds them to keep the secret about Narnia and not tell about it to anyone unless someone mentions to have visited it first. As a devout Christian, C.S. Lewis made his work not just a fairy tale for his children, but he used it to spread the Christian ideology. The book is not a biblical allegory. Lewis filled the story with elements of Jesus' story so that the children could see the story of Christ under a new light. We have to keep in mind that the horror of war has affected everyone deeply and if religion was the only place to find the minimum of hope, Lewis wanted the children to discover it in a softer way that was really needed at the time. Through the character of Aslan and the children, Lewis softly suggested that a world that rejects Christianity is a world marked by suffering and sorrow, a literal winter for the soul. When Lucy walks into Narnia for the first time, she sees a peaceful landscape covered in snow, where Mr. Tomnus walks by carrying packages. She believes that Christmas is near. However, Tumnus reveals Lucy that Narnia is under siege and that the White Witch has made it as it is always winter and never Christmas. So in Lucy's mind, the Christmas may have more a Victorian aspect of sharing presents and gifts around the Christmas tree in a house full of decoration. This withholding of Christmas for Lewis is more intended as a withholding of the celebration of Christ. The White Witch has made Narnia a place without Christ. Under Lewis' pen, Christmas is brought back to the value that it used to have before Dickens and his Christmas candle. Christmas was originally the celebration of the birth of Christ. It was a spiritual moment to pass in church and praying. Aslan is the most overt symbol of Christ. The first time that the children hear his name, Edmund, the traitor, is filled with horror. But the other three experience wonderful feelings as Peter feels suddenly brave, Susan feels something delightful, and Lucy feels a sense of glee and anticipation. This is a pointing to how Jesus' followers feel when they think of him. Edmund is the portrait of sinners and liars. The children have not met Aslan yet, but the only mention that he is about to come brings sudden change into Narnia landscape. The snow begins to melt, hindering the white witch sleigh, filling all Narnia with excitement and anticipation. Father Christmas arrives, bringing gift of encouragement to Peter, Lucy and Susan, but his departing hail, Merry Christmas, long live the true king, is a reference to Aslan, or maybe to the future King Peter, but it's also a clear reference to Christ, the King of Kings. 
Ultimately, it's impossible not seeing the sacrifice that Haslan makes to save Edmund as a metaphor for the passion of Christ. When the White Witch claims that, as a traitor, Edmund is her to kill, she is clearly the allegory of Satan, to whom sinners belong. Aslan makes a deal with the witch, exchanging his life for Edmund's. Aslan is led to the stone table, humiliated and shaped before being executed. Lucy and Susan attend Aslan's corpse as Mary and Mary Magdalene attended Jesus. And when Aslan is resurrected and the stone table cracks, we have an instant image of Aslan as Narnia's immortal savior. Whoever reads the New Testament can see the parallelism between Jesus and Aslan. I personally read the Chronicle of Narnia when I was a little girl and I could clearly feel the magic that suffused Aslan and all the surrounding of him. consider this book a book for children, I'm about to change your mind. In spite of its fantastical atmosphere with magic, mythical figure and even characters of folklore like Father Christmas, Narnia is not free of problems. The children leave a world devastated by war to find another world almost as in bad shape as their own. Lucy is the first of the siblings to enter Narnia and she has the impression to have entered a dream world. Miss Autumnus, telling her story about nymphs and dryads, enlarged her feelings of comfort, but when she decides to get back home, Miss Autumnus, sobbing, tells her that he must hand her into the White Witch, and Lucy realizes that Narnia is dangerous, and not as perfect as she has thought. The second time that we see the kids entering Narnia, Lucy goes straight to Mr. Thomas. Edmund follows, but he can't find Lucy. Instead, he encounters the White Witch. Edmund struggles a lot with the fact that he wants more freedom and wants to break free from Peter's authority. The White Witch offers Edmund a way to escape from this situation by promising to make him a king of Narnia. But we all know that this is a lie. Narnia is not a place where we can escape our problems of the real world. Instead, it's a place where the problems are magnified and the children have to face their problem and take their responsibility. The kids escape a world in war just to find themselves in another world at war, when they have to fight in first person to set it free from the threat of the White Witch. Every time that the portal of Narnia opens, the kids are trying to hide from something. When they all end up into Narnia, they are hiding from the authoritarian housekeeper, Mrs. McReady. The two older siblings abandon their idea that they can indulge into fantasy when they find that Mr. Tunnel's house ransacked. Susan is the first one giving up to Lucy's pledges that she can leave Mr. Tunnel's in the witch's hands, and when she says that thought she wishes she had never come to Narnia, they cannot turn their back now. This is a C.S. Lewis attempts to make clear that it's impossible to escape from a world filled with war, corruption and pain. Even in fantasy world there are suffering and strife. Nobody can leave their problem behind, not even children, and fantasy cannot help us. If we look at the story with this perspective, we can insert C.S. Lewis in the group of authors that created a fantastic world with the impression of being free of problem, but then force the reader to face that the world is not free of dangers. J.R.R. Tolkien with his Lords of the Rings, Terry Brooks with the Shinara Saga, and obviously G.R.R. Martin with the Songs of Ice and Fire. The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is a piece of literature with strong messages underneath, even if it's suitable for children. We tend to consider the Chronicles of Narnia just a good book for children. I hope that I have been able to change your mind, and maybe to have triggered in you 
They yearn to open that book with a renovated interest. C.S. Lewis created an important piece of literature in a world that was torn with war. And if you think of how the world was feeling after the two world war, it's undeniable that he brought a spark of light and hope in a world where grief, shell shock, PTSD, hunger, poverty of the soul and of the mind was thriving. We owe C.S. Lewis more than we may think. He was able to bring in a post-war war the same hope that Victorian Christmas used to bring before 1914. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, please give us a thumb up. If you want to subscribe to the channel to be updated to all the literature video that I post out, please ring the bell and subscribe to the channel. We are a language school. We teach English, French, Spanish, German, Italian for foreign years. We deliver courses online and in presence. We teach teenagers as well as adults. Obviously, with this video, I just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and I hope to see you next year with a new video from the Literature Snacks. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for staying with us. Bye-bye.